Our scripture passage this morning comes from the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, the 13th through the 21st verses. Listen, hear, and receive God's word for us. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. When the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go to the villages and buy food for themselves. And Jesus said to the disciples, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. The disciples replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. They do not need to go away. That was Jesus' response to his disciples when they suggested that he send the crowd away as the hour had grown late and the people were most likely hungry. They do not need to go away is an ironic response considering that Jesus had gone out to this deserted place in an attempt to get away from the crowd and to be alone. Jesus was tired. He had been rejected by his own in Jerusalem, queried and dismissed as demonic by religious leaders. And Jesus was grief-stricken after learning that his cousin and forerunner, John the Baptist, had been brutally beheaded. Rejected, exhausted, and grieving All of those things were integral to Jesus' desire to step away from the large and desperate crowd, to interrupt his parabolic discourse, suspend his preparatory instructions to his disciples, and to seek out a solitary desert or deserted place for a time of nourishing contemplation and to commune with God, to be replenished and to prepare himself for his impending crucifixion. One commentator writes, in Hebrew thought, the wilderness or desert is connected with wandering or uncertainty. It is a place of rebellion against God. It is also the place of temptation, the testing ground for Jesus at the outset of his public ministry. End of quote. It was to this place of wandering and uncertainty, temptation and contemplation that the crowd followed Jesus walking along the shoreline as he rode out in a boat. And when Jesus arrived, the people met him there desperately seeking healing for their sick. Despite the fact that Jesus desired to spend some time alone, he saw the people and he saw their need and he responded with compassion. Jesus saw that they were emotionally, physically, and nutritionally hungry and broken. These people had left their hometown seeking the man from Galilee, whose reputation of healing the sick, standing up for the oppressed, the outcasts, and the disenfranchised, had preceded him. They knew that Jesus had freed people who were imprisoned by an unjust society and social structures, or by their own proclivities. They knew that Jesus was speaking truth to religious and governmental powers and performing miracles, yes, raising the dead, giving and restoring sight to the blind. And the same Jesus, you know, he was no respecter of person, for his circle included tax collectors, fishers, women of ill repute and impeccable reputation, and sometimes hot-headed and faithless men. And Jesus' followers, They were Gentiles and Samaritans as well as people of Jewish descent. 
The people who followed Jesus along the shoreline knew, just as the woman with the issue of blood, that if they could just get close, they too would be healed. Not because Jesus was a magician or a sorcerer sent by the accuser, but because he was a man who took the time to get proximate to and to be re in relationship with people. And he was filled with compassion that exceeded sympathy. Jesus did not feel sorry for the people suffering from various and chronic illnesses. Jesus had compassion that moved him to do something to alleviate infirmities, to heal, and to set people free. To quote Brian Stevenson, the execu executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, we can't change the world if we are not willing to get close to those who are suffering. There is power in proximity. When you get proximate to people who are suffering, you can wrap your arms around them and you will be empowered with the belief that you can change the world. This will allow you to change the world." End of quote. The disciples still did not understand Jesus' ministry in its totality. When evening began to fall, they were more concerned with logistics than the needs of the people. I don't believe that they even considered or thought that it was their responsibility to feed the people. For their very words imply this. According to the writer of Matthew, the disciples said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now late, so Jesus send those people away so they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. One commentator writes, the desert raises profound questions about the source of human meaning and identity, security and sustenance. Fundamentally, it challenges the very idea of God's faithfulness and provision for human life." End of quote. And I contend that too many people exist and live in deserted places right here in our church, in our community, and in our very own families. People we would rather ignore walk by without acknowledging their humanity, much less their need. People we feel sorry for, but are not moved to get proximate to, to stop and greet them on the street, to walk a block with them, to determine how we can extend radical hospitality and enter into relationships of mutuality. Instead, just like the disciples, we would just rather send them away. Sending people away was not then and is not now an option. It's not an option because it is not a Christ-like response. If the disciples had succeeded in sending the people away to the nearby towns for food, most likely the people would have remained hungry and possibly stranded as the towns were not stocked or equipped to address the enormity of the need. EOPC, there are times when we are disciple-like. And believe me, I too have been like the disciples at times as well. It's easier to send away people. It's easier to pick up the phone and call the police, to hire constables to send our neighbors who are in the rain garden away, or to just ignore them, to ignore their humanity, to be blind to their needs, or to fail to make time to get proximate to them, to be in relationship with them, and to accompany God's people. Jesus told the disciples, the people need not go away. You give them something to eat. Jesus' instructions about and the miracle of feeding the 5,000 is the only miracle that is recorded in all four of the Gospels, with the exception of Jesus' resurrection. Clinton Kirkpatrick writes, obviously this miracle was of great importance to the early church. Some suggested that it was read regularly when Christians gathered at the Eucharist. Others suggest that it shows a parallel to God's provision of manna from heaven for the children of Israel. Most important than any of these reasons, this account of the feeding of the 5,000 was treasured by the early church because it taught Christians the very heart of the gospel message. 
and was a deep source of hope and inspiration for Christians who were seeking to be faithful against all and great odds, end of quote. To consider that 5,000 men, and that's not counting women and children, were fed with just five loaves of bread and two fishes secured by the disciples, and that 12 baskets of leftovers were collected afterwards is indeed a miracle beyond our human comprehension. And it is an example of God's provision and God's love for humanity. Some of you may recall that Dr. Asa Lee, president of the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, preached from this same passage this summer. And he surmised that in addition to the miracle of God multiplying the loaves and the fish, it is possible that the real miracle was that the people who gathered there began to share what they had and served one another and supplemented the disciples' meager find. And by doing so, the people had more than enough to address everyone's hunger. Clinton Kirkpatrick posits, we learn from this account about being disciples, about the awesome responsibility that God has entrusted to us. Jesus did not feed the 5,000. He told the disciples to do it. God has entrusted us, all of us, to be the body of Christ, the hands and the feet through which God's work is done in the world. God does not work alone, but through people, you and me. To follow Jesus is to express our faith in concrete acts of love, justice, and compassion towards others. It is no accident that Matthew tells us that we meet Jesus in reaching out to the least of our brothers and sisters, our siblings, the hungry, the thirsty, the imprisoned, close quote. Beloved, we have more than enough to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to comfort the grieving, to care for the sick and the least of these. We have more than enough to support the mission and the ministries to which God has ordained and called us, this local church. We have more than enough time and talent to serve and to get proximate to the people with whom we share this community. Everything that we need, we have. It's just a matter of us being willing to open our eyes to see the need, to open our hearts to respond and to use the resources some of y'all know what that means. <laughs> that God has given and entrusted to us to show compassion and to be the people that God created us to be. And when we think that we do not have the resources, the time, the ability, or the compassion to be faithful disciples, Kirkpatrick writes, God will give us the power to work for good in the world a reality many of us have discovered when faced with situations we were not sure we could manage. When Jesus told the disciples to feed the 5,000, the disciples thought that it was impossible. The needs were so great and the resources were so few. However, when the disciples worked together and followed Jesus, they had more than enough. End of quote. I want to repeat that. When the disciples work together, when we work together, when all of us work together, we can move mountains. We can address and remedy many of the hurts, the needs, and social ills when we work together. This Stewardship Sunday, we will find that when we work together, we have more than enough to serve God and to serve one another. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Beloved people of God, 
When we operate out of abundance rather than scarcity, and when we operate as souls filled with the love of God, the compassion of Jesus Christ, and the power and faithfulness of the Holy Spirit, we are enough, and we have more than enough. Amen.